Good evening and welcome to the 2021 Nova Lieutenant Governor's Republican Candidate Forum. My name is Gary Higgins and I'm the chairman of the 10th District Republican Committee and I will be serving as the MC for this evening's forum. The event is hosted by the 8th, 10th and 11th Congressional Districts and the Fairfax County Republican Committee. On behalf of each of your NOTA, on behalf of each of your NOVA Republican committees, I would like to welcome you and thank all of you for joining us this evening. I also want to thank all the candidates who are participating tonight. We are looking forward to hearing your visions and plans for restoring the Commonwealth to a sane, sound, and reasonable governance. We would also like to thank the folks who have sponsored these forums, Ivan Raitland and Melissa Bowden. We would also like to say a special thanks to Republican GOP and especially Sean Ratstatter for handling the technology portion of this program. To begin this program this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Sharon Sadler. She's the chairman of the Loudoun County Republican Committee and she's going to lead us in the invocation. Sharon, if you would. Thank you, Gary. Uh, please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, through your word and through your son, you have taught us to serve. We gather here this evening to meet candidates who are offering themselves to do just that, serve Commonwealth, serve neighbors, serve God. Lord, we ask you to grant our candidates the strength and steadfast compass and courage needed to go the distance. Grant them humility and grace to recognize each other as friends in whatever outcome and grant our Commonwealth the wisdom to make the best choice. Lord, you have allowed a wonderful country to flourish on this land, and we thank you. We know it is our job, all of us, to serve it well. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, Sharon. Jonathan Nave, who has served on the 10th District Congressional Committee, uh, will be leading us in the pledge this evening. Jonathan, take it away. <clears throat> Gary, I don't think Jonathan's on. If you could uh, do us the honors, Gary, if you don't mind. I can handle it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now I'd like to introduce Steve Knotts, the chair of the Fairfax County Republican Committee he will be reading the Republican Creed tonight. Thank you, Gary. We believe that the free enterprise system is the most productive supplier of human needs and economic justice, that all individuals are entitled to equal rights, justice, and opportunities, and should assume their responsibilities as citizens in a free society, that fiscal responsibility and budgetary restraints must be exercised at all levels of government that the federal government must preserve individual liberty by observing constitutional limitations, that peace is best preserved through a strong national defense, that faith in God, as recognized by our founding fathers, is essential to the moral fiber of the nation. Gary, you're muted. Chairman Higgins, you are, you're muted. Please unmute yourself. Gary, you're still muted, Could you, uh, if, you, if you don't mind. Everybody hear me? Everything good now? Yes, sir. All right. Nothing like technological difficulties. Is uh, Rich Anderson on? Uh, is he going to speak to us? Let me find if he is on. He is not on tonight. All right. Well, we'll move on. I'm understanding he was going to be with us. No, he's, uh, he's uh -oh. with us. Nope, I'm he here. Isn't. Ah, Rich, go for it. Sorry about the confusion. 
Well, thanks very much. Uh, I tell you what, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking because you're not here to talk to me. You're here to hear from great candidates for the office of Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so I will just say thank you to our great candidates for stepping forth and offering yourself and public service to our Commonwealth. And I say thank you to the congressional district committees that are sponsoring tonight's discussion. And so with that, let's think about November because November 2nd will belong to Virginia Republicans. Thank you. Thank you, Rich, and thank you for being here with us tonight and for all of your hard work. Um, I am gonna go over the rules this evening. You all have received copies of these, but I wanna run through them quickly so that everybody is aware. Surrogates will not be allowed to participate in place of a candidate. Candidates may not participate from a car or vehicle. During the debate, the candidates will keep their cameras on at all times. Candidates who drop off from the webinar or join join late may retake their place in the rotation, but may not gain back time if they've missed an opportunity to speak. No participant in the forum shall be allowed to use props or visuals. Candidates may refer to limited notes as prompts. Candidates may write notes for their own use throughout the program. No rebuttal or right of reply opportunities will be available at any time. The candidates shall not be allowed to interrupt one another. The moderators, rules committee, and technical team will present or will be present and are present to enforce these rules. Interruptions may result in a candidate being removed from the forum. If a candidate experiences technical difficulties on their end, they may be dropped from the stream while they correct the problem on their side. All questions are predetermined. No questions will be taken from the virtual audience. Commentary analysis or follow-up questions from the moderators will not be permitted. Questions will be answered in rotations. Candidates will have as much of an equal opportunity as possible to be the first, middle, and last person to answer the questions. Initial ordering will be in alphabetical order by candidates' last names. Each candidate will be allowed a three-minute introduction, two minutes to answer each question, and 30 seconds to answer each question in the lightning round and two minutes for closing comments. Each candidate will receive a 15 second warning and a call of time when their allotted time has elapsed. And each candidate will have five seconds to complete their sentence once they've been warned and then they will be muted. Now, as we begin the forum, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the team that will be facilitating this evening's Lieutenant Governor's Forum. The moderator from the 10th district is 10th District State Central Committee Representative Mark Sell. The moderator from the 11th District is State Central Committee Representative Mike Ginsburg. The moderator from the 8th District is 8th District State Central Committee's Representative Sarah Curran. Technology timekeeper, that's Fairfax County's Vice Chair, Sean Ratstatter. And the Rules Committee is made up of 11th District Chair Melissa Bowden and SEC Representative Mauricio Tamargo. I will now turn this over to Mark Sell, who's going to begin with the questions. Go ahead, Mark. Gary, we do have a small challenge. One of our candidates is uh, participating from a car. The rules that you just read did state that all candidates need to be participating from a laptop. We would ask that candidate to go ahead and hop off and get on the laptop and then they can rejoin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. Winsome, you're on, you're on mute. I am on a laptop. The laptop is in a car. So if you're saying that uh, you want me on a laptop, I am on a laptop. In the rules as stated, candidates may not participate from a car or vehicle. We kindly ask you to, to go and, and to um, find a place where it's outside of a vehicle. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if it's not all right with everyone, I think we can just we can just get going. I mean, I, I don't see an issue here. She's on her laptop and she's not physically moving. If it's all right with you, Melissa, I think we can we can just get started with our four candidates, five candidates. As long as the car is not moving. Yeah, exactly. 
I, uh, I'm okay if we proceed and uh, she is in uh, possession of a laptop and she's not moving. So if that's all right with the other chairman, I'm uh, willing to let things proceed. The car isn't moving. I understood that I needed to be on a laptop and please excuse me if I made that error, but I, I assume we needed to be on a laptop. The car is not moving. As the chairs are fine with proceeding, let's go ahead and move forward. Thank you. Mark, take it away. Okay, thank you, Gary. Uh, we'll begin with opening statements. Uh, each candidate will get three minutes for an opening statement. The candidate order will be Aluwalia, Allen, Davis, Hugo, Riggler, and Sears. Uh, so we will start with you, Mr. Aluwalia. Go ahead, Penny. Is he on? Penny, you're muted. Just have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Perfect. Sorry for the delay, folks. Uh, my name is Puneet Aluwalia, and um, I've been a long-time member of the Fairfax County Republican Committee and been active in the Northern Virginia area. I got into this fight uh, last year because I saw the direction our state was going in, and that concerned me because I've seen socialism, I've seen the divisive politics, I've seen identity politics, racial divides uh, on first-hand basis and from where I've come from, which is India. And as I've traveled extensively and I do religious freedom work, I, I see the divisiveness that it leads to. And when I started touring all over Virginia and I started talking to folks, I was able to capture the emotional disappointment, frustration, which is what I'm voicing. I'm a candidate of the people. And the reason why I'm running is because I'm tired of losing and being converted in the way the frog theory works is towards socialism. Our state, our country is in a, very, in a very serious predicament. Hence the reason, folks, I became a citizen soldier. When you find ways to justify looting and rioting, when you find ways to put your policemen and women in defensive, you don't hold the leadership accountable and there's lack of transparency. And then anything, anytime you say your First Amendment rights are infringed upon, your Second Amendment rights are infringed upon, we are in serious trouble. And if we as a country, as a state, as folks who love our nation, would not wake up and do something about it, then I guess we'll be doing a disservice to our great nation and the founding fathers who saw this dream. Hence the reason I'm the only candidate who is a first generation immigrant, who can talk to the changing demographics of Northern Virginia, of Richmond area, of Virginia Beach, who should be seeing and talking about these issues. And any time when folks have talked to me about minimum wage issues or critical race theory or the issue on immigration. I have voiced it. This is just not about me. It's about us, the people, we the people. Hence the reason folks I'm running. I understand small business issues. I understand the challenges because I've raised my three kids in the Fairfax County school system and they study in the Virginia school system and colleges. My wife and I work very hard. We are the American dream, which is in peril. If we all don't stand up and speak about this and hold the Democratic Socialist Party responsible and do not shake the people up, I'm sorry, we we'll lose our great republic. My name is Puneet and I appreciate the opportunity to stand strong with my great friends who are running and fighting for this liberty and growth and freedom and opportunity in this great nation. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everybody. Okay, uh, thank you, Puneet. Uh, Mr. Allen. Hey, can you hear me all right? Just wanna make sure the mic's on. We can hear you. 
Okay, great. That, <laughs> that makes it good. Um, all right. So my name is Lance Allen. I'm running for the office of Lieutenant Governor. I uh, just want to say hey to everyone. Sorry for joining late. Thanks so much for having me and thanks so much for organizing this. Um, so let's just cut to the chase. A little bit about me. I grew up in the onion fields of South Georgia. My grandfather took me in when I was about six years old. Um, my one going joke is my grandfather knew what child labor laws were. He just really didn't care. So I spent most of my mornings picking and planting onions. and I spent most of my evenings picking and planting onions. No money for college. I joined the Air Force at 17 years old, uh, right out of high school. And I did 10 years there as an intelligence operator. So I did counterterrorism, counter narcotics, and homeland defense. Those are all just really big ways to say I help put warheads on foreheads, take out bad guys, help protect troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. And at the end of the day, I help keep America safe by advising policymakers. Um, so sorry if you had a, a long wait in line at the TSA line, right? That was a little bit me, and I apologize, but I don't do that anymore. More importantly, I'm a father and I'm a husband. I have a 10-year-old Jake, a two-year-old Harper, and a five-week-old Archer. So aside from campaigning, I have many, many late nights uh, and I enjoy it. Uh, Mountain Dew keeps me going. You'll see me sipping on it throughout the night. So listen, why are we all here? Um, I believe that Joe Biden kind of exposed the truth. Politicians have long believed that our rights are negotiable. They don't believe that they're absolute. I believe that is not a Republican issue or a Democrat issue. I believe there are politicians on both sides of the aisles who feel that way, even right here in Virginia. Uh, we've had politicians who voted against families by voting against school choice. We have had politicians who claim to be fiscal conservatives, yet voted for Medicaid expansion when they knew it would bankrupt our state and leave us with a $13 billion annual price tag. And most dangerously, they've negotiated our Second Amendment rights with gun reforms, restricting your right to conceal carry allowing localities to ban firearms, and most dangerously, introducing red flag laws, just disguising them as something else. And so I'm here tonight to say that our rights are not negotiable. They are absolute. I'm tired of business as usual politicians. I think we're all tired of business as usual politicians. They get to the General Assembly and they use special interests and lobbyists as, as training wheels, right? They want payouts and promises, and they forget that they're there to represent us. So I'm here to stand up and fight for those rights because our principles and our party are important and what, be, what we believe is important. So I'm hoping that we can have a discussion about moving beyond the talking points. You wanna open businesses, that's great. So does everyone else. Let's talk about the problems pressing against businesses in Virginia. You wanna open schools, that's wonderful. We could open them tomorrow and it still wouldn't solve our education problem. There are real problems in Virginia and I'm hoping tonight we can talk about the different ways we all wanna solve them. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, Mr. Davis. Well, thank you so much for having me and having this forum. I really appreciate appreciate the opportunity. For those that don't know me, I'm uh, Glenn Davis. I've had the honor of first serving on the Virginia Beach City Council and local government for five years, and now the honor of serving eight years in the Virginia House of Delegates. Professionally, I'm that serial entrepreneur. As the story always goes, I got my start by losing my job six weeks before Christmas in 1999, and out of a one-bedroom apartment, built my first company, which was an IT company. Seven years later, it was one of the 100 fastest growing IT companies in the US, according to Inc. Magazine. And I don't share that because I'm one of the smartest people you're ever gonna meet, but I am one of the hardest people you're ever gonna meet because that's how I was raised. And I'm very passionate about that American dream and protecting our small businesses, because that is truly what this nation was built upon. Not the thought that someone's given something, but the ability for someone to create something for themselves and their family. I've been on the front lines fighting for our Second Amendment rights for the last eight years, specifically the last four years on the Firearms Subcommittee, fighting where it's nine uh, Democrats, three Republicans against all the bills thrown at us. I'm the one the BCDL turned to when their Facebook page and their volunteer administrators pages were turned off. When I say I support charter schools, I support it because I actually helped start a charter school in Virginia Beach, and I know firsthand what that actually does. When I say I know how to bring jobs to, uh, to Virginia, it's because I've fought 300 jobs at Danville, Virginia, about a year ago, just as I promised last time I ran for Lieutenant Governor. And about a year and a half ago, we cut the ribbon on a 50,000 square foot building for this company. And 180 of the first 300 uh, jobs started at an average salary of $18 an hour. You know, I think what this is all about, you know, we're all Republicans sitting here. We all believe fundamentally in the same things, but we need someone that can win because ultimately what we're all asking for is that you place your trust and the faith an opportunity in the future of your children in one of our hands. We can't afford to be wrong. 
We don't need someone who thinks they can win or someone that wants that first shot at winning or someone that wants to come back into the ring. We need someone that's proven that they can win in Purple District, that they can win statewide. We need someone that's never lost to a Democrat. And that's me. They say, you know, Mike Tyson has the perfect quote when he says that everyone has a plan right before they get punched in the mouth. My first race I won for city council in 2008 was against a 28 year incumbent. Her husband was one of the most senior Democrats in the Virginia House of Delegates, Glenn McClannan, for those that have been around a while. In 2019, the Democrats spent $1.1 million against me. We spent 250,000. They spent 750 on TV and radio. We spent zero, but we took the fight to them. And in a district that Tim Kaine won by 10, Ig Gillespie lost by five, by sticking to our principles and values and going into non-traditional Republican communities, showing how our beliefs solve their issues around the kitchen table, we still won by 500 votes. That's how we won in 19. That's how we win statewide. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share a message with you tonight. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, next is Mr. Hugo. Hey, Sean, thank you. Hi, everybody, I'm Tim Hugo. I'm running for Lieutenant Governor. Just a little bit of background again, again about me. Uh, I grew up in uh, Virginia Beach and uh, you know, after college, I moved up to uh, Washington, D.C. looking for my job. Got the perfect job as a, uh, a receptionist. Uh, worked my way up the food chain for five or six years and then I uh, did get that perfect job and I walked in and turned it down because y'all, many of y'all know me as W. Hugo, but uh, I enlisted in the Army because I'd seen young men and young women getting on a transport and I knew there was something more that I needed to do. So I went to basic training at the age of 28. And again, it was one of the highest honors that I've had. Fast forward, I got elected uh, 17 years in the Virginia House of Delegates. 10 of those years, I was the number three in the house, elected unanimously each time by my colleagues to represent the conservative Republican values that we all believe in. I was on commission labor and I got to be a chamber person of the year and fought for small business and things like this. But the core issues people always ask about, where are you on life? Where are you on 2A? Where are you on taxes? On life, I voted down the line, pro-life, not afraid of it, unabashed, pro-life. And in fact, outside of, the, outside of the Virginia House of Delegates, I lived that fight. You see, there used to be an abortion clinic by my kid's school. And we would go over there sometimes and pray after, uh, after church on Sunday. And somebody came up to me once and said, Tim, remember, you need to pray like there's no work and work like there's no prayer. And what they meant was that abortion clinic was for sale. And we put, my wife and I, I'm not a rich person, but we put $5,000 of our own money in, worked with neighbors, friends, family. And today, where there was once an abortion clinic killing innocents in Northern Virginia, today there is a pro-life pregnancy center in Manassas providing free health care to young women. I was part of that. We bought that abortion clinic and it's now a pro-life pregnancy center. On the Second Amendment, look, I'm from Fairfax, but I've got a lifetime A rating from the NRA. VCDL called me pro-gun because I see the Second Amendment is the amendment that protects all the other amendments. It is, it is foundational to everything else that we have, and we will protect that. And I did that not once, not twice, for 17 years. A rated lifetime from the NRA. On the tax issue, look, we got, we got you get elected, you run, you say you're not going to vote for taxes, you're not going to vote for taxes. And I didn't. Sometimes my friends in the business community say, hey, man, the election's over. You can vote for it now. And I said, no, I voted no. I voted no on Medicaid expansion, no on the taxes that I think have plagued us. And we've done that. I'm a consistent, common sense conservative. I grew up at the beach. I represented Northern Virginia and Fairfax, but I vote like I'm from the Valley. I'm a conservative and I'm here to fight for you because I think, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't fight this year, we leave our children a battle they may not be able to win. This is our time to fight. I think lurking together, we will stick together and do that. God bless you. Thank you for having me here tonight. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hugo. Uh, next up is Ms. Regler. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Great. My name is Mae Regler, and I am running for Lieutenant Governor. You all might be asking, well, who the heck is Mae Regler? And where has she been? Well, let me tell you, I'm a native Virginian. I was born and raised in Fairfax County. I'm an attorney, I'm a business owner, and I am a political outsider. And I am really tired of career politicians dictating the terms to we citizens. Look, we need to shake things up here in Virginia. We need a political outsider with fresh ideas and a fresh face. 
I was honored to be part of the Trump legal team last November. And I saw firsthand the importance of voter integrity. It is incredibly important and we have to protect it. Well, I was saying that the even though we are who we are, we know what happened in 2020. And since the election of 2020, I have been waiting and expecting my opponents for Lieutenant Governor to stand up and speak out forcefully for voter integrity. But you know what I've heard? I've just heard crickets. And that's kind of silence to me. And that's why I am running. We need a candidate for Lieutenant Governor who will speak out against voter fraud. We need a candidate for Lieutenant Governor who will fight for voter integrity. We need a candidate for Lieutenant Governor who will not buckle under the pressure of the Democrats. Look, we know what happened in 2020 in states like Georgia and Pennsylvania and Michigan and other states. We cannot have that happen here in Virginia. This race is not about endorsements or who you know or how long you've been in office. This race is about beating the Democrats in November. We must, we have to. Look, I know I'm emotional about this. I'm 100% Irish, I can't help it. That passion runs through my blood. But with passion comes action and with action comes results. I am a fighter. I have always been a fighter. Look, I know what it's like to be in a corner when no one is fighting for you. I had to escape a terribly violent family life when I was 16 years old scrubbing floors and cleaning toilets to get by. And I learned a lot from that. I learned that anyone can overcome adversity so long as you believe in, the, in faith, in individual liberty, and economic opportunity. And this is what the Republican Party is all about. Your time is up, Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Riggler. Uh, next up is Ms. Sears. I'm so glad to be here with all of you, my fellow Republicans and conservatives and deplorables and everything else that they have called us. Folks, we've got to win this year. My name is Winsome Sears and I'm running for Lieutenant Governor here in our great Commonwealth. As most of you know, I have put together a five point plan on ballot box integrity. It was the very first thing that I ever did when I first announced back in January. It is on my website and we have talked a great deal about it. So I'm not gonna talk about that here because it's already out. Uh, my father came to this wonderful country with a dollar 75 and I thank you for accepting him because it changed the trajectory of his life, changed my life, changed my family's life. As a consequence, he put himself through school, took any job he could find, and then he started his career and is comfortably retired now. Folks, I am not a victim. My father was not a victim. He started with $1.75. This is America. You can get there if you want it. The opportunities are here. My father came during the height of the civil rights movement. The jobs were here, he said. And so you understand, we are facing critical race theory. Folks, the law was just passed in March that any new teacher and teacher wishing to be relicensed must have an African-American endorsement in critical race theory. That's supposed to benefit people who look like me. I don't know why we have that because it's an invitation for racism. It's no longer reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's reading, writing, and racism. Furthermore, these Democrats have gone crazy in putting together marijuana laws, which not only is going to decimate the black community, but it's definitely going to destroy the rest of us. We need someone who can get us across the finish line. That would be me. I'm a Marine. I'm an immigrant. I have all the boxes checked that the Democrats are hoping you don't send me up as your next Republican lieutenant gubernatorial candidate. 
folks, we got to win this year. That would be me. I can make it. We have to win. Once again, we have to win. I thank you and I hope to hear from you with all of the information and questions you have. Excellent. Thank you all. I guess uh, we'll move on to a question one. Appreciate those uh, great responses and I will move on into question one. Um, and the order for question one will be as follows. Uh, Alan, Davis, Hugo, Riggler, Sears, and uh, Alawalia. So question number one is this. On April 10th, 2020, Governor Northam signed into law five gun reform bills. Uh, one of those bills uh, signed into law in, included an emergency su substantial risk order, or what is commonly called red flag laws, which allows a court at the request of the state or of law enforcement to uh, prohibit a person who possesses a substantial risk of injury to himself or others from purchasing, possessing, or transporting a firearm. If you're elected lieutenant governor and this issue, and if you're as lieutenant governor, you would have to vote in the event of a tie in the Senate. If this issue came before you, uh, would you vote for or against a red flag law uh, provision uh, and why? So the first would Thanks, be uh, Lance. Howe. Thanks, Mike. How long to answer the question? Oh, I apologize. Two minutes, two minutes each. Okay, thank you. Uh, so first off, uh, shall not be infringed was not a suggestion. Our rights are absolutely absolute. <laughs> spent 10 years in the Air Force defending those rights. Men and women have died on battlefields across our nation and across this world defending those rights. Um, so I would absolutely vote against any red flag law. Listen, red flag laws violate due process. But more importantly than that, they're dangerous. They are completely dangerous. Here's an example that I like to use. The same people reporting you on Facebook right now as an extremist, a domestic terrorist, or a racist, and taking away your right to free speech, those are the same people who will report you to the red flag tip line and have your firearms taken away. And once we've set that precedent, once we've said, I don't like you, I don't like what you say, I don't like how you look, so I'm going to take your stuff, once we've done that, where does it stop then, right? That's why it's so dangerous, because now that I've taken your firearms and I'm silenced you, now maybe I'm going to take your house. Maybe I'm going to take your property. Maybe I'm going to take those computers. Maybe I'm going to take your money. Maybe I'm going to take your children because you're an unfit parent. That is the premise of a red flag law. Without any evidence, without any crime, without any due process, the government can step in and take what rightfully belongs to you, even though we have a constitution that says otherwise. And so I would absolutely vote down red flag laws. And I would absolutely say that, you know, we need to we need to be aware that there are Republicans on our own side. They can throw as many NRA lifetime ratings as they want. But I remember a certain delegate from Fairfax who co-sponsored a red flag law bill. He just called it something different. These are not just things that are happening off in the distance. They are things that are right here, right now, and they are affecting all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Delegate Davis. Thank you. So I'm pretty sure I'm the only one on this panel that you don't have to guess what I would do because I'm the only one that's had the opportunity to take a vote on this. In the 2020 session, this bill came in front of us. It came in front of me multiple times. First in subcommittee, I voted against it and spoke against it. Then in full committee and spoke against it and voted against it. Then on the floor of the House of Delegates and voted against it. Then I did some online videos on YouTube that you can still find against it. Um, look, red flag laws are, are uh, bills that, as you've heard, they take away our due process. But most importantly, what I hate about what the Democrats did, look, we knew it was going to pass, but where was the protection that they should have at least put in there that had substantial penalties for filing false reports? I mean, the Democrats passed this thing, I think, pretty much on a partisan vote, and then you lose your weapons now because someone reports you, but there isn't those stiff enough penalties for those that report you falsely. And that's even a worse situation. So I, uh, I've had the opportunity to stand against this. Uh, Bill, in multiple cases, I had the chance to uh, to stand up against the um, one gun a month bill. I was the one when the background check bill came up in the 2020, and you can go to my YouTube page, Del Glenn Davis, and actually see a video of me in rapid fire succession since they only gave us all combined five minutes to debate these bills, literally rip apart the background <clears throat> check bill in about a minute and a half. 
Uh, and you can look at my other votes. So I think I'm the only one up here that was in office in 2020 when all these things came down. And I was on the front line, three Republicans, nine Democrats on this firearm subcommittee. And I've been fighting them sec uh, ever since. You don't get to come after our second amendments. It's in the Bill of Rights for a reason. It's the second amendment for a reason. It protects all of our other rights. And we need to make sure that we preserve that for that next generation. Thank you, uh, Delegate Hugo. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, as I said, I'm a, a lifetime member of the NRA, a lifetime A rating, a pro gun from BCDL, and I've talked to them about all these bills, and I would have voted no, and I would vote to repeal them because as Glennon indicated, and also as Lance indicated, they come after your guns. And the best, worst thing about that bill, I think was just stated, is that they had no protection for people falling, filing false claims. This is a danger. It's an inherent danger to us. It's an inherent danger on the Second Amendment, but this concept is an inherent danger to everybody. This is what they are coming after. They are coming after your Second Amendment. They're coming after your First Amendment. They're coming after speech. The Democrats are insatiable that they believe government knows best and they believe government will do best. And that's why we've got to vote no on issues like this. That's why we've got to repeal uh, these laws, but that's also why we've got to continue to fight and win this year. And we've got to work with our allies in the NRA and work with our allies in VCDL and Gun Owners of America and all these organizations that fight it day after day after day. Again, I did it for 17 years, fought it, stood up, didn't, didn't have to talk about it. I did it every year. We'll continue to do it. That's why they gave me an A rating lifetime and we will continue that fight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rigler. Yes, I would definitely vote against red flag laws, and I would be a strong advocate to repeal the red flag laws. Listen, this is a slippery slope here. It, it's it's horrible. Let's just say hypothetically, we have a neighbor. I have a neighbor, and we don't get along, and that neighbor knows I have a gun. And let's say we get into a dispute. Well, you know what? I live in Northern Virginia. There are a lot of very, very strong progressives here in Northern Virginia, and they can get it into their head that they can go to the Commonwealth attorney who by the way in Arlington is extremely, extremely progressive, and they can talk that Commonwealth attorney into going against me because I'm a substantial risk to that neighbor. This is a slippery slope and we have got to stop it. We have to repeal these laws immediately. Look, I'm a big second amendment I, I support it 1,000%. I do not support any laws or regulations that in any way inhibit the use or ownership of guns. Look, this is personal to me. I lived on a, a farm in beautiful Virginia, and I can't even imagine myself or anyone else alone not being able to see a neighbor for miles without a gun, okay? So we have to make sure that these liberals, these progressives do not get away with this nonsense. Look, the average person in Virginia who owns a gun, they don't want the heavy hand of the government into their lives. They just don't, whether they're Democrats or Republicans. The cry, unfortunately, with the tragedy of the Virginia Tech shooting, that I am unarmed was not an effective defense, and especially not an effective defense against a terrible criminal. So I would vote against. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sears. Folks, I am continually in awe of our founding fathers, their wisdom in putting together our constitution and the Bill of Rights. And the fact that our second amendment right is absolute there is no if, there is no and, it is absolute. There is no buts. And so what I'm saying to you is red flag laws would not survive if I am elected to office. <clears throat> would in no circumstances, listen, I was uh, in a very rural area, not very many people around. And a friend of mine was looking at a piece of property of his and he saw someone coming from that property and he turned around to go investigate what the person had been doing on his property. And I immediately said to my friend, so-and-so, do you have your gun? Because I wanted to be sure that we would be protected because there was no one around, just us, no police, 
no sheriff. We need to have our guns. By the way, I am not going to defund the police. That is the silliest thing I've ever heard. And now Minnesotans and others who have done that, they now know it. They have disrespected the police. And so now they are having to pay, for example, $6.2 million to bring them back, which they don't want to because they understand the treatment that they were going to get. And so I'm saying to you, under no circumstances, no red flag laws, and we're going to repeal, if I have anything to do with it, the giddiness and power that the Democrats have put all of the other gun laws on the books. That you can count on, and you don't have to worry that it's because I'm going to lose a race why I suddenly make a change in my position. That's not me. That might be others, but that's not me. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. And Mr. Alawalia. Mike, thank you for the question. Folks, the reason I got into this fight was when they came after our gun rights in the last year in January, I wrote an article in Washington Times where I said it's harder to oppress minorities which are armed. There's certain things which are non-negotiable. Our First Amendment, our Second Amendment, and our Constitution. And I stand strong on that. And I tell you the reason why I know that. Because when you are a minority or a law-abiding citizen, you become a target and a very easy target. And it is also another important thing which I can share with people is that if you have your Second Amendment rights, you are a citizen. The day you lose that, you become a subject. So folks, there are certain things which are sacred, which you cannot touch and should not be touched. Or And the Democrats have a very smart way of bamboozling us by putting all these various laws on us and then we get confused and then say, oh, gee, we have one victory. No, certain things are non-negotiable. Second Amendment, First Amendment and our Constitution. And then I'll go next forward. I come from a warrior race. It's in my DNA to fight. At the same time, in my faith, we carry a sword and that is for righteousness. It's to protect my community and to make sure that when the thugs or the Antifa or BLM or anybody who comes out tries to loot and riot, which they did last summer, on our property, we can protect ourselves. I am gonna be very straightforward and call it as it is, because folks, we have tired of making deals with the Democrats and the Socialist Party. We need to call them out for who they are and what they are, and that's what I'm doing. Hence the reason, folks, certain things are non-negotiable, and I will stand strong for that. Thank you for that question. Thank you, candidates. So this next question is gonna be about economic issues. Everybody gets two minutes. Here's the order. We're going Davis, Hugo, Regular, Sears, Alawalia, and Allen. Um, so how would you leverage the Lieutenant Governor's office to maximize its influence? So as an example, you'll be obligated to, by statute to serve on eight boards and councils. Two of these boards are the Board of Directors for the Virginia Tourism Authority and the Board of the Virginia Economic Development Partnership Authority. These positions grant you the authority to play a direct role in helping to restore the Commonwealth's ravaged economy. What two plans or initiatives will you bring to these boards to restore Virginia's economic health? We're starting with you, Mr. Davis. Well, thank you so much. I mean, look, I've been that serial entrepreneur starting at the age of 26. I've started small businesses, I worked with other small business owners to grow their companies. The first thing we need to do, especially working with economic development and some of those commissions, is to put as much of a focus on growing our small businesses organically as they already do today on bringing businesses here, arguably buying businesses to come here. Look, when a business starts in an area, they're, they're, they're part of that community. They're vested in that community, and that's why they stay there. Microsoft, Facebook, they don't stay on the West Coast because it's the best tax policies. They stay there because they started there, and they're vested there. So we need to make sure that those next big companies start in Virginia because they'll stay in Virginia. If you buy a company to come to Virginia five years later, 10 years later, when those economic opportunities pass away, another uh, state can offer to buy them back. The second thing we have to do is immediately get our, uh, our tourism areas open quickly. You know, the state of Virginia and all of our tourism areas, whether it be out in Bedford, where they have a lot of tourism and that amazing uh, D-Day Memorial out there, down to Williamsburg, down to Virginia Beach, uh, and even some of the Northern Virginia areas that have so much vested in tourism that have heard so often, we need to put marketing dollars in there to kickstart that economy again, that piece of our economy, to make sure that that revenue starts coming in for localities so they can fund our schools and our teachers and our law enforcement 
and also that revenue starts to also come into the Commonwealth so we can afford to maintain the services that our citizens have come to expect. And additionally, as Lieutenant Governor, people ask me, Glenn, what are you going to be? I say, you remember Bill Bowling? I'm going to be Bill Bowling on steroids. You know, I've already showed that when I promised 300 jobs in Danville, I didn't do it by repeating 200 times, have all the senators voted. I went to Danville and I put together and negotiated a deal. I went to Estonia in 2016 to talk to an entity that had delivery robots that now you find on the campuses of George Mason and JMU. So that's the best part of the job I'm looking forward to. Thanks so much. Thank you. And Mr. Hugo, you're you're up next. Hey, hey, thank you very much. Look, for 17 years, I was on the Commerce and Labor on Finance Committee, fighting for small business and fighting for business. You know, things that we did day after day. You know, we brought one of two of the bills I did, had to do it two years in a row, bring piece, bits and pieces, bought $1.5 billion worth of economic development to Virginia. And it's outside of Richmond now, not in Fairfax County or Northern Virginia, in Richmond we brought it. But the thing is, on tourism, I grew up in the beach. We've got to make sure we make this the best place in America to do business again. It used to be. The Democrats, since they've taken over in the last few years, it has gone downhill. We had with Bob McDonald, with the Republicans in the House and Senate, we had the best place in America to do business. We had low regulation. We had low taxes. We had ease of use for our business, for our government. There was a working together with business and government to provide economic opportunity. That's the way it can operate, and we can do it, whether it's on the Tourism Committee or, or Commission or on BDDP. But I would say to you this. I've seen lieutenant governors, Democrat and Republican, kind of just sit there and enjoy the lieutenant governor spot. You have an obligation and a responsibility to get out there and advocate for conservative ideas, Republican ideas, and advocate for economic opportunity. Like we all, many of us come out of the business world. We know what needs to be done. You have that bully pulpit. It's not just breaking ties. It's not just sitting there waiting for something to happen to the governor. It's giving that speech. It's taking our values to every part of the Commonwealth, every county, Northern Virginia, Southside. But it's also we're taking that message to other areas, to other areas outside, outside of Virginia. I think a leader can do that. That's what I'd like to do because I think our values are the best. I think our ideas are Republicans, conservatives are the best. And I think Virginia can once again be the best place to be do economic business and have job growth. I look forward as a Lieutenant Governor to help and make that happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Frigler, you're up next. Thank you so much. Um, this issue is very passionate to me. I am a business owner. So I believe very strongly that we need to, first of all, open the economy of Virginia. We have to go by the lead of Florida and Texas, get rid of that mask mandate. And we just have to have big signs everywhere saying we are open for business. So how do we do that? You know, it's been heartbreaking over the last year. We've lost so many jobs and so many businesses. So we have to bring them back and we bring them back with policies, policies like lower taxes and fewer regulations. Look, we need to lower the income tax here in Virginia. It's 6%, that's too high. We need to make it lower. We need to lower the individual taxes so that people want to move here and start businesses here. Right now it's 5.75. You know, the, the average in the United States is 4.67. Listen, we have to be more competitive and we have to be business friendly. I want to make Virginia number one in job creation and I want to make Virginia number one in business friendliness. And in terms of the tourism, oh my gosh, we have to fund the police. Tourism, people go where it's safe. So we have to make sure that we keep funding those places so that they keep us safe. And then the tourists will come in droves. We have businesses open, we have mass mandates gone, and we have it's safe for people to come to Virginia. And that's what we are all about. Open up for business. Let's let it happen. Thank you. Fantastic. Now, Ms. Sears, you're on deck. So I am a small business owner. And in fact, my business dropped 25% because of COVID and the governor making a decision about who could be open and, and who needed to stay shut. And thankfully, he made a decision that a business like mine is uh, an essential business. And so here we were back open again and able to provide jobs for my employees. Folks, I know what it means to be a business owner. I know what it means to pay onerous taxes and to live under onerous regulations. 
One of the things that we're gonna do, if I am the Lieutenant Governor, I'm gonna put in a study to see what needs to be gone when it comes to business regulation. We are regulating ourselves to death. I, and, and so that needs to go away. Furthermore, when I was uh, employed by the Hampton Roads Chamber of Commerce, one of my jobs was to bring uh, look at business development and education because the fact of the matter is businesses will not relocate to any area that is undereducated or uneducated. And so we've got to ensure that we have the workforce that is ready to accommodate the businesses that we are trying to attract. We know that, for example, that cybersecurity, healthcare, and computer technology are three of the fastest growing industries. And so if we're going to try to attract those kinds of uh, companies, then we certainly have to have the education stream that goes with it. Additionally, I know that we were having a quite a bit of uh, the backroom operations uh, coming to Virginia, we wanted the front room, meaning we wanted the higher paying uh, headquarters jobs. So quality of life is also something that will attract businesses because they're gonna want to have employees who enjoy where they are, otherwise the employees aren't going to come. So all of those can be effectuated by the Lieutenant Governor and I hope to get that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Alawalia, the floor is yours. Sarah, thank you. <clears throat> Folks, I had no choice but to work hard and succeed. I have created multiple businesses today. Grace of God, my wife and I have multiple businesses and we know how to do, manage them and create jobs. The important thing is I'll be the best CEO, the CEO or the governor have, who we have, who will hopefully be a conservative governor. My goal would be to expand the party, use this platform to make sure that Fairfax County Republican Committee and Loudoun County Republican Committee and Prince William Loudoun County Committee has a million dollars to fight the Democrats. At the same time, I'm gonna make sure that we have impactful legislation which are gonna have sunset provision on taxes which should make this state business friendly in first place. You just cannot grow the businesses. You have to create an environment for business to be there and to thrive. And most importantly, when I've spoken to the 1400 small business owners, what they wanna make sure is that this is a consistency and they need a fighter who can fight the democratic overreach. That means you can keep a business open from till, 10 or, till 12 o'clock, but only serve liquor till 10 o'clock. You don't want to have minimum wage. People are getting money paid at home and they have no obligation and no commitment to come to work. And if they want to come to work, guess what? They want to get paid cash. These are real issues. When you go talk to the folks in Southwest Virginia, we have, did we not know that we need Wi-Fi there? We want our kids to challenge on a global stage. Why? My goal is to try and find ways to create jobs, try the success of Northern Virginia with the rest of Virginia. We are, there's no two states. There's one state and one beautiful state, and that's for lovers, that's Virginia. That's the other thing which I want to work on is to make sure, to make sure that our commitment to the people in Southwest Virginia is true. Because what we have been doing is promising things, but not been delivering. We have to make sure our school systems are in the best of shape with no critical race theory. At the same time, I have asked for Secretary Kearney to resign so that he does not make our students divisive and racist. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're gonna close this question out with Mr. Allen. Hey, thanks so much. I appreciate it. What a great question. Um, so first thing um, I'd like to see is uh, one of the things that I would use the office to advocate for is what we call uh, a Virginia Reigns Act modeled after the federal law to get rid of burdensome overregulation. Virginia is the seventh most regulated state in the entire nation. That's not something that happened overnight. Republicans can brag about tax cuts all day long, but they were in office when a lot of these regulations and, and oversized fees got put on small businesses. Small businesses make up 97% of our employers, and for over a decade now, they've been dying slowly, uh, and no one's bothered to step in and help them. So I'd like to see that. Number two, I'd like to see us crack down on special interest giveaway and corporate welfare, right? Picking the winners and the losers. So we break our backs and we give Amazon you know, the tax breaks that no one else gets. Meanwhile, the rest of small businesses across Virginia have to make up those tax breaks. You and I have to make up those tax breaks. I'd like to see us focus on innovation and incubation within our own state because my opponents are right. When you build inside the state, they have a reason to stay. They don't want to leave because they're invested. 
Uh, number three, I'd like to see us focus on things like agriculture. We can talk about cybersecurity and technology, and those things are absolutely wonderful and great. Agriculture is a $91 billion industry. It is the biggest industry in Virginia. As a matter of fact, I'm going to rope in infrastructure here. We rank 35th in the U.S. in terms of infrastructure, behind Alaska, and they spend most of the year in the dark, folks. We spend most of our infrastructure, billions of dollars, on northern Virginia. But there's an entire state that we have to talk about. And that, that goes in terms of not just, um, not just investment in infrastructure for agriculture, but investment in infrastructure for tourism. And lastly, and most importantly, I think we have to protect our history. If we want people to come here and visit this place. We have to make sure that not every year we're changing the tourism sites. We're not, changing, we're not erasing the history. There's something to come home to. There's something to see here. So those are the things I would like to advocate for as Lieutenant Governor. All right, thank you, candidates. Uh, the next question, question three, will be on uh, Lieutenant Governor and policy. Uh, you will each have two minutes to answer, and the candidate order will be Hugo, Riggler, Sears, Aluwalia, Allen, and Davis. The question is, name one disastrous policy of the Northam, Herring, Fairfax administration that you will work to reverse as Lieutenant Governor. And we will start with Mr. Hugo. I, I, th I think the first thing we just talk about is, is opening the schools uh, and opening the, the economy. If you look at the schools, I'll tell you a story. You know, my wife well, today went and picked up and helped a young child because that child is now at home with her with a parent, without a parent. She has to have a 12 year old help her help that child get ready for school, help that child get ready for things they need to do. We are hurting a generation of children. The, the North administration, with their closure of schools, has set back so many children for a decade and set back our economy. I want you to think about the parent, the single parent, the parent with two work, two parent, both parents work, the parent that has to leave a six-year-old at home, the parent that just says, hey, English is not my first language, and I'm trying to help my child do math, and calculus, and chemistry. Northam, the schools, what he has done is a disaster. It's a disaster to our economy. It's a disaster to our children. It's a disservice to Virginia. If we don't get our schools open, get our kids back in, it will continue to uh, for, for a decade. And I would just ask you, look, the Catholic schools are open. The Christian schools are open. Many of the private schools are open. And they've been able to do it without a problem. This is a problem because the Northam administration has bowed down to the teacher teacher union leadership. And if we don't say enough is enough, we will destroy our economy more. But more important, we will hurt and continue to hurt a generation of children. I think that is the greatest disservice that Norton has done. I think parents should be mad. I see parents mad in Fairfax. I see parents mad in the beach. I see families hurting across the Commonwealth. This is something now that we have an opportunity to right. But more important, we have an obligation to right that wrong that Northam has done to Virginia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hugo. Uh, next up is Ms. Regler. Thank you very much. Uh, in terms of the Democrats and the socialist agenda, where do I start? If I have to pick one, there are lots, but I will pick one that's very important because if we don't have voter integrity, then all of the wonderful issues and things that we believe in as Republicans won't matter because the Democrats will simply steamroll us in November. Okay, so we have to reinstate the voter ID law. That is extremely important. That would be my first order of business, voter integrity. We have to make sure that the voter rolls are constantly reviewed so that we make sure that this, their citizens of Virginia, they're on the rolls, that they're not dead, they're not passed away, and they haven't moved out of the state. We have to make sure that they're US citizens that are voting. I mean, we have to absolutely be more vigilant in our expression of concern. You know, we've been very trusting up to this point, but I learned being on the Trump legal team in North Carolina that we cannot take our trust for granted. I just learned so much about the voter integrity, and I learned about how easy it is for the Democrats to steal elections from us. So we have to really get on this and get on it. It has to be number one priority. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Regler. Uh, next up is Ms. Sears. Thank you. Apart from these aberrant uh, gun laws, I would say critical race theory is a troubling, troubling matter to us all because it is going to pit us against each other. As vice president, former vice president of the State Board of Education, I know that our children aren't already learning. In fact, there are 15 year olds can't even pass a, 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 a um, international test called the PISA test, which tests reading and arithmetic and uh, science. 30 countries are doing better than us, and yet we have time to teach critical race theory. And I'm uniquely qualified to talk about this because it is supposed, to, and I mentioned this at the outset, help someone who looks like me to gain some, somehow some kind of better understanding. Folks, all it's going to do is cause morale in our schools to deteriorate when you're telling the white child that he is nothing and his, he is racist and his family before him are all racist and they are telling the black kids, the Asian kids, and the Latino kids, yes, this kid is racist, et cetera, et cetera. It's gonna destroy us. I think the Democrats are bucking for a second civil war because they're trying to make people who look like me be victims. You've got the Asian kids at Thomas Jefferson doing exceptionally well. And instead of us trying to figure out what are they doing that is so wonderful so we can emulate it? What are the parents doing? What are the study habits? No, we are trying to create quotas and uh, we have a senator, Louise Lucas, trying to figure out who is a minority and who isn't because she's black and, and, and the kids are Asian. My God, this is not a great uh, way for us to be in the Commonwealth. And in fact, our country, it is ripping us apart. And it is time that we say to these Democrats, thus far you have gone and it is too far. And we're gonna repeal all of that. I won my race in a 60% black district. I don't need anyone to tell me I'm black. I just need the political party, the Democrats to get out of the way. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sears. Uh, next is Mr. Aliwalia. Mark, thank you for that question. I call him not anymore governor, I call him King Ralph because it's the King Ralph who's giving the mandates who he thinks are his subjects, not the citizens of Virginia and the United States. My first big issue is the critical race theory which is being imposed on our kids. That's the reason I asked for Secretary Kearney's resignation because I have come from a country where you divide and fight and kill people over race, the color, the ethnicity, the faith. It's unacceptable. This is not the America. It's one nation under God, indivisible. So when you take the Pledge of Allegiance, just remember those words to all the democratic socialist people who are out there. Second question, Virginia is a big country, it's a big state. And we are a big nation. Some issues are important in Northern Virginia. Some issues are important in the rest of Virginia. Folks, we need to open up our economy. We need to get these mandates off so that businesses, restaurants can go back to normal. And guess what? There are psychological impacts which are happening on families. Opioid crisis is going to be the next serious thing we'll be looking at. This is the reason why it's important just not to look at one issue or two issues. There are multiple issues. They're letting criminals out of jail. What are we going to do about that? That's the reason you need someone who's a fighter who's going to call them out and make sure that he supports impactful uh, legislation which are conservative and hold the governor, hopefully it's a conservative governor, accountable. That's what I'm going to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alawalia. Next up is Mr. Allen. Yeah, so um, I hope you'll you'll bear with me. This this may not be the, uh, <laughs> the the sexiest of issues, so to speak. But I think, you know, the question was about you know uh, laws coming out of the administration. And I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to to take on the um, Reproductive Health Protection Act because I see it as anything but that. And if you'll just bear with me here for a second, I tell people all the time, don't ask me what I am, ask me why I am. And I believe in the protection and the safeguarding of all lives and. Just because babies are tiny doesn't make them any less human. And so what we saw coming out of our government was basically the taking away of those protections, right? So they took away your ability to get ultrasounds before, uh, before you have an abortion because they don't want you to see the unborn features is what, is what they like to call them. They don't want you to see the tiny face and the tiny eyes. Um, I think that's a travesty. 
uh, travesty. They took away your ability to have counseling of how dangerous those procedures actually are. They take away your ability to see what the alternatives are uh, because maybe you don't want to do this. Um, I mean, I like to tell people, you know, you want to talk about numbers alongside the, the death of 20 million unborn you know, humans stands the tragedy of over 10 million women enduring abortions, dealing with the loss and not having anyone to care about them or do anything. There was one organization called Women Exploited by Abortion that grew from two women to over 10,000 women. So I'd like to take that on. One of the things I'd like to propose is a heartbeat bill. Um, the sanctity of human life is so important. It's a moral obligation. It goes far, it goes far beyond uh, politics. The, the second thing that I'd like to do is I'd like to make it mandatory that if you do seek an abortion, um, that you have to be given the alternatives. You have to be told how dangerous these procedures actually are, and you have to be given access to counseling, and you have to be given access to things like ultrasounds. You have to understand the decision that you're making. And I think that is probably, for me, one of the most important issues I could ever hope to take on in this race, or ever. Um, yeah, it's just an important issue. I don't think we talk about it enough. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, next is Mr. Davis. Thank you. You know, it's uh, sitting in the General Assembly and seeing all these 2,000 bills come through every year, getting passed out. It's a laundry list. So if you ask me, you know, where do I start? I start with election integrity. Look, if anyone can question the integrity of the ballot box, the whole foundation that our nation is built upon starts to crumble. And that's the place where we see our nation at today. So at a minimum, you know, the first thing you go and you bring back the requirement of voter ID. Look, I, you have to have a ID to be able to go get that library card. Why should you have to have one to go do the most fundamental thing we do in our country? And that's vote for those that lead us. We also need to make sure that when you have absentee ballots, that there's a witness signature. Once again, you need to bring back that integrity. But those two things only get us to where 2020 was. And I would argue that many of us still question the integrity of the ballot box back then. So why would we use the technology we have today and our rest of our personal lives and in the private sector to give more uh, comfort in the integrity of the ballot box? Why is it that when I leave here tonight in my office and I go to McDonald's and I buy dinner and I go home, that my wife and I are going to get an email saying we used our credit card at this McDonald's at this place? Why is it that when I go vote or if someone were to happen to vote under my name, that I don't get an email saying that we have you recorded having voted at this time and at this place. It does two things. One, it deters that type of fraud. And secondly, it gives us all comfort that that type of fraud is not occurring. And if it did, we can correct it and we know about it. You know, but you can't just stop there. I, if anyone knows me, I know about multitasking. So not only do we have to get voter integrity stuff corrected, but cultural competency, we haven't really had uh, uh, cultural race theory come in yet. It's coming on the backside of this cultural competency uh, legislation that passed this year that I fought in the General Assembly about to stop our teachers from having to have cultural competency training every two years. That needs to be reversed as well. And the same thing with getting rid of some of this collective bargaining stuff. So I have a huge laundry list. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate the, the great answers. Um, moving on to a question for campaign candidates, uh, Nova uh, election strategy. This is another two minute question and the order will be uh, Ms. Riggler, uh, Ms. Sears, Mr. Alawalia, uh, Mr. Allen, uh, Delegate Davis and Delegate Hugo. And the question is this, uh, when we go to the polls in November, uh, one of you will be running against a Democrat for the office of lieutenant governor and northern virginia as we all know has trended blue over the last several years for over a decade now at this point but gaining uh, votes here in northern virginia will be critical to winning a statewide race like the lieutenant governor's race what are the two issues that you would particularly focus on to win over northern virginia voters in the general election and Thank so you for that uh, that'll begin with uh, Ms. Regler. Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no problem at all. Um, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, we have to mobilize our base, first of all, to in this next election, and that won't be hard because the Republicans are extremely tired of all of the failed socialist policies of the Democrats. So we're very motivated. So this is going to be a based election. Okay. And Virginians are angry. They're angry about the economic shutdowns. 
they're angry about the school closures. They're angry that the teachers unions have been dictating the terms to the parents. They're angry about all of the job losses. They're angry about all the businesses that are going under. They are angry and they're ready for change. And they're ready for a fresh face. They're ready for not establishment, but for change, for someone that can, they can, can speak to them, speak their language. Northern Virginia has 25% of the vote in the Commonwealth. It's very important that we're able to reach out and basically touch them with our issues. So what are those issues? We have universally popular issues that I think can basically cross the line to the independence. Because as we know, we have to give independence a reason to vote for us. And the, the reason are the following. OK, we've got school choice, especially with the pandemic and the lockdowns. I think that parents are rethinking, rethinking the whole concept of school choice. You know, we would say we'll take the lead of Iowa. The governor of Iowa has been very successful in passing legislation for school choice, not only opening up more charter schools, both bypassing a lot of the bureaucracy of the school boards and going directly to the state election, you know, this uh, Department of Elections. But what she has advocated is fabulous for students and parents. Essentially, it's scholarship monies that would otherwise go to the state schools, would go to parents. And that's our big issue for November. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Ms. Sears. Yes. Well, one of the things that I did in the past two years, uh, I followed President Trump uh, where he said he needed new voters in order to win, in order to expand the Republican Party. And so one of the things I did was I have this booklet and so I was, and we put it out in the various communities, a black community, et cetera, to talk about all the good things that the Republican Party has done. And it's actually effective, not just in uh, the black community, but in others as well. Met a lot of people there who were Asians for Trump, uh, Latinos for Trump, et cetera. So we know what works because we were able to bring in new voters and that's what we have to do. We know that in the suburbs, as well as in the urban areas, all the people therein, they are concerned about safe schools, safe neighborhoods, the ability to enjoy a good quality of life, the ability to understand that their children will have a future. And so it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out that if we speak to those needs and we show how we can do that, then we're just about home free because we have the answers as Republicans. We know that our policies aren't going to pit one race against another. We know that our policies are transparent. They open up opportunities. They create opportunities. We don't, we don't give people the fish. We teach them how to fish. We have training programs that we have. Uh, I see I'm almost out of time, but we have training programs that we can provide for people. And so we aren't interested in making people equity, but so that we have equal outcomes, but rather that we get equal opportunities for the pursuit of happiness. And so that's why I think I can especially speak to Northern Virginians as well as all of Virginia. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Mr. Alawalia. Mike, thank you. Uh the reason I got into the race because I realized for the last 12 years we haven't won. And the reason why we don't win is because we don't talk to communities of the changing demographics of Northern Virginia, Richmond area, and Virginia Beach. Hence the reason I joined the fight, because I am already talking to these communities. I'm part of that community. I've been living in Northern Virginia since 93. I've served on boards of bank. I've served on, I've been a Rotarian. I've been a very active member. My kids have gone to schools in Fairfax County, and then we are part of the community, very active in that sense. Folks, People in Northern Virginia want common sense leadership. We want to make sure that the COVID uh, vaccine and the rollout and the safety is done in a thoughtful process. We want to, want to make sure that our kids are being taught so that they can compete not only within the state of Virginia, but on a nationwide and a global stage. We want our kids not to be frustrated or confused or upset when they are taught critical race theory. 
They want to get our life back to normal, which means is opening up businesses, opening up restaurants, because I believe each business owner knows how to run his business in a common sense fashion. We want our life back to normal. But the most important thing is safety and security. We cannot defund the police. We want to make sure that if they dial 911, the police is there. But at the same time, when the police comes and by the accident happens, the police person is not accused and then, and then charged with manslaughter. We need to make sure that we respect our men and women in blue. Most importantly, immigration is a big issue. Folks like me who have come to this country legally, we want to make sure there's a, there's a process in this state and this country that people come here legally so we don't overwhelm the system. We want to talk about common sense idea, which resonates with every person, just not with Northern Virginia, which makes sure that we can raise a quality family, have a good life, and, and be proud Americans which I am, and I know most of us all are. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next up is Mr. Allen. Hey, thanks so much for the question. So if you are in Northern Virginia tonight, um, there are way more than two issues that are important to you. So I'm gonna try to pack them all in as best I can. If you want a business in Northern Virginia, I want you to know that you deserve to be open, that you deserve to have regulations and taxes lifted. We're the seventh most regulated state. We've been putting more regulation on small businesses over the past decade than any other state in the United States. You deserve to be able to run your business. You be, deserve to be able to earn a living for your family and for your employees. Uh, number two, if you're a business or you're an employee, which most of us are, I wanna cut taxes. We all talk about you know, kitchen table politics and working families. Look, some of us can barely afford to live in the state, much less Northern Virginia. That's, that's something completely all on its own. I know that because my wife moved, my wife and I moved as far away from there as we possibly could because of property taxes, because of taxes and income uh, taxes. So I'd like to see us cut taxes so you can afford to feed your family and pay your bills. Um, secondly, uh, or thirdly, you deserve school choice. If you're a parent, you deserve parental choice. Um, I would argue that you've had conservatives in that area who weren't really conservatives. And one of my opponents says, you know, he just changed his mind on school choice. We don't have time for white conservatives to find their values anymore. There are real conservatives out there who believe that there's nobody who's going to fight harder for your family than you are. And I'm one of those conservatives and I want your voice and I want your vote. And lastly, I, I think defunding the police, right? You deserve to be safe. Your family deserves to be safe. You deserve to live in a neighborhood where you know you can walk out and you don't have to worry about what trucks are being set on fire or what businesses are being looted. And so I promise that we're gonna fund the police across the state of Virginia. Um, those are the things that I think that we can do better all across the state, but specifically in Northern Virginia. Thanks so much for your time. Excellent, thanks. Uh, Delegate, da uh, Delegate Davis. Well, first, if we want to win in a blue area, I'll, you know, choose someone that's actually won in a blue area. I mean, this is what I've done down here in Virginia Beach. Ironically, I think the last Republican that ran for statewide office that won Fairfax County was Bob McDonald. Guess what district he represented earlier when he was a delegate, the 84th district. Look, it's all about having someone that knows how to go and build relationships and have built relationships with the communities you're looking to grab votes from. Now, when you start talking about issues, there's a couple of things. First off, the Asian community up there, the Asian Indian community up there are up in arms over cultural competency and critical race theory. Why? Because of what's happening to Thomas Jefferson. There's a huge debate going on over how the administration and the Virginia Board of Education want to lower the emission standards to further diversify. It came to me in front of the education subcommittee. I've taken that one on. I gave a speech in the education sub where I was told by my colleagues they were offended. I did it again on the floor of the House of Delegates where the, my majority leader told me she was offended. But guess what? Uh, being offended is not an argument. And you don't diversify a school by lowering a bar. If you want to feel good, you do it by bringing up communities through school choice. I've been carrying this and fighting this since uh, February. I had a debate at JMU's campus over this uh, with Elizabeth Guzman, where we showed the future of education is the Republican policy that we can put in place. If you want to go a step further, you want to bring back suburban moms. Look, we've had a problem as Republican women suburban moms. Guess whose children's just lost a year of education? Is the suburban moms. The women up in Northern Virginia are irate over their children being pushed back a year and losing that year of education. So we take that for them as well. But why stop with just Northern Virginia? You know, there's a lot of African-Americans in Petersburg whose children are not getting a good quality education. Most of the schools are not accredited, but could use school choice. And like Donald Trump said, what have you got to lose? 
That's the message we need to bring forward as Republicans across the Commonwealth to give voters we don't traditionally get. Thank you. No, wonderful. And uh, our final uh, response on this one is uh, Delegate Hugo. Hey, hey, Mike, thank you. Yeah, if you want to win in Northern Virginia, why don't you pick somebody that's won up here for almost two decades? And that's that would be me. And I've won by talking about things like the economy. And we've talked about the economy. And we've talked about schools and we'll continue to talk about schools. And Glenn, you mentioned TJ and you're absolutely right. But let's be really fight. Let's take the fight to the Democrats and say what they are doing with Thomas Jefferson is the underpinnings of their argument is racist in nature. Let's take the fight to them because it works one race and it is pitting races against each other and it is wrong. And let's talk about the police. I want to talk about, I was talking to a police officer the other day. He said in Fairfax, this new Commonwealth attorney, they do not prosecute any misdemeanors. And why do they not prosecute misdemeanors? Because they were funded by George Soros. Let's talk about that. Let's take these factual arguments. George Soros took 600,000 and took out a Democratic prosecutor in Arlington, 500,000 for a Democratic prosecutor in Fairfax, and $1.2 million to take out Loudon's Republican candidate. This is what we are facing, my friends. This is a danger to our economy, a danger to our families, danger to the schools, and that's what we will do. We will talk about what it means to your family. But let us also talk about too, part of it being in Northern Virginia is reaching out and understanding tone. Tone matters in the suburbs. You've got to have the right tone to approach the suburb. You've got to have the right message. And you talk about the economy, if you talk about schools, and you talk about public safety in your family, that's how you reach people. And look, I didn't get, I got elected for almost two decades by going and talking in black churches, going and talking in Korean churches, reaching out to the Korean community, to the Asian community, to the Indian community when they were being targeted in Northern Virginia a number of decades ago by a ring that was a, a, a drug uh, trafficking ring or a legal ring that was coming over from Maryland. We work together when we talk about public safety, the economy and schools, and we have the proper tone. We will win. I did it for almost two decades. I look forward to helping you next fall. Thank you. Well, y'all are doing great, and that is a great segue into our next question. This is question five on security and rule of law. So same rules, two minutes each. We're going to Sears, Alawalia, Allen, Davis, Hugo, and Riggler. So to start, um, the Virginia Democrats have followed national trends to target state and local law enforcement with significant budget cuts. In last August's special session, Democrats, including gubernatorial candidate Delegate Lee Carter of Manassas tried unsuccessfully to slash the Virginia State Police budget by 25% and to reduce the aid to local police departments by millions of dollars. Ultimately, they did cut 4.7 million from the school resource officer grants program. Um, many American localities that have cut or attempted to cut their police budgets are now faced with increased crime rates, coupled with officer retirements and low police morale. Yet some Americans, particularly minorities or people of color, genuinely fear police interactions. As Lieutenant Governor, how would you ensure we properly fund and maintain public safety while also addressing these concerns? Thank you, and I'm gonna go with Ms. Sears to start. <laughs> so we, you talked about uh, minorities and uh, their fear of police. I want to say that being the minority that you're talking about, the person on the street, the regular Joe, we don't really have that issue because we understand that if you defund the police, then crime increases exorbitantly in our communities that are already <clears throat> distressed. And so we know we need our police and, and we don't want them to be defunded. Those who look like me are the elite they live behind gated communities or they live in much safer neighborhoods where some of the people I know, they're living in communities that are very, very difficult. And so we don't want that to be defunded. So let me say that at the outset. The second thing we need to do is to build relationships with the police. We need to put the police back on the beat, walking the neighborhoods, especially back in the cars, when I was a homeless shelter director, one of the things that we wanted to do was to get big brothers and big sister mentors. And I know that the, the safety 
the, the resource officers in schools could help with that. And, and in fact, they play a big role in that. Um, another thing that we need to do is to have stations, police stations in the communities instead of elsewhere, like downtown. We need to put the substations back in the communities so that there can be relationships built, possibly renting out even uh, areas in that substation for local community activities so people aren't afraid. And we need to restore the funding because our policemen, we, their, their families don't even know if they will make it back home that night. So we have to ensure that the citizens are safe, but the police are safe as well. And that training among the police is Thank effective you, because we've got to get rid of bad apples. Thank you. Thank you, Winston. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to go to Mr. Alwalia. Sarah, <clears throat> the one thing that separates us from banana republics and our nation is the rule of law and law and order. And we want to make sure that we always maintain that and make sure it is always funded and also the right resources are provided to our police officers and their families. We have to stop treating them as robots. We have we have to not treat them with contempt. We have to respect them because they also it takes a lot to wear a, a uniform. My grandfather was in the police and we come from a long line of uh, warriors who have worn the uniform. So it's important to respect them. But I also believe that the fear that has been created has to do with the media. Yes, we have bad apples, but at the same time, we want to make sure that if there are people who need psychological help, they need support, we should provide it to those police officers. At the same time, if we really want our police, our minority communities and other communities not to be feel threatened, why don't we hire police officers from those communities? Let them, those because that becomes a bridge with those communities, because if you want to look at Northern Virginia, Look at our Republican Party. If you go to the Fairfax County or the 10 district event, how many colored people did we have? If you want to grow the party or you want to grow the police force, then you bring people from those communities. You just don't have them sit from outside and watch it because that's how you break the barrier. You break the food, you break the, 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 break the bread with them. And what you do is get to know the culture and appreciate the culture. And most importantly, it's important that we also penalize and also hold accountable bad actors in police. And that's the reason why what happened, tragic death of George Floyd, that police unions have been protecting these bad actors. We need to get them out and get them out of the police force. So our kids, a minority uh, community people, or anyone, as a matter of fact, should not fear for their life because if they're going to come out of the car, they're going to get shot. That's not to be it. Police is to serve and protect. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Allen, you're up next. Right. So I believe the first thing that needs to be addressed here is that if you are watching, um, you need to know that under no circumstance should you be scared to interact with the police. That That is not. And you should never feel that way. And I hope you never have to. Um, my heart aches for those that do, because that's a real thing and you deserve to be heard. That voice deserves to be heard. You should know that there are, law, there are law enforcement agencies out there who understand that there are bad actors in law enforcement and they want to take them out. I spent many weeks with the State Police um, Association, the director, Wayne Huggins, talking about this specific issue. And one of the things that he confided in me was that lawmakers would come in his door, ask for his advice on legislation. He would give it. They would lie to him and say they were going to do it. And then nothing would ever happen or the opposite of it would happen. Republicans and Democrats alike. And I think that has to stop. I think that we have to uh, expand the national decertification index, both in our state and across the nation. What that does is it allows police um, agencies, law enforcement agencies, to share information. When a police officer does something bad, right now, that agency can't share it with another police or uh, law enforcement agency. So he could go get, he or she could go get hired somewhere else. Under the decertification index, right, we're able to share that information so that that bad actor doesn't get hired on somewhere else or that people at least know what's happening with that individual. Um, thirdly, I, I think that we have to fund the police. And what I mean by that is it's funny how, uh, you know, the Democrats want safety in schools, but then they pull the funding for the school resource officers. Um, we need to fund them so that they can have resource school resource officers training and resources for things like community policing. Lastly, I would just like to say that we should also do a better job of putting laws in the books that don't, um, uh, don't conflict with what our law enforcement know and understands to be true. Like in Fairfax alone, just a few years ago, you had a delegate who co-sponsored a bill 
that would waive, uh, excuse me, that would impose excessive driving fees, speeding tickets up to $1,000. Of course, you're going to be scared and mad and angry, right? So we have to stop passing bad laws that conflict with what we know to be true and good and right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Going to you, Mr. Davis. Sure. So, you know, I'm, I'm a son-in-law of a, a retired NYPD officer, and I knew firsthand the sacrifice our law enforcement officers make. And we need to stand up for them because they spend their whole career standing up and watching out for us. You know, when you look at what, you know, the Democrats have done, it's kind of crazy and almost just moronic. Um, you know, they, they talk about, they, they want to make sure that our, re our officers are trained appropriately. You know, one of the best things we could ever do, and we did it when I was on city council here in Virginia Beach, and that's to have our officers literally walking communities. We had our officers, and the chief of police was amazing with this, their officers would walk communities and just knock on the door, not because they were looking for someone or not because anyone was in trouble, but they literally just knocked on it, introduced themselves, just wanted to see how the people were doing that day and built those relationships. So when something happened in a community, those community members felt comfortable calling law enforcement and letting them know, and that's important to do. But when you defund the police, the problem is, is two things happen. The first thing that happens is you don't have time to, you don't have the resources to have our police get the additional training that they may need out there to help further their understanding of those with uh, uh, mental disabilities and mental challenges and the stuff that the Democrats want our police to understand. The second thing that happens is we have a hard time recruiting new officers. And when you attack police and call them racist, we really have a hard time uh, attracting new officers, but also we lose some of the older officers through early retirement. Now we don't have enough officers to be in the communities to go through there and build those relationships and knock on those doors. So the Democrats want to talk about what they want out of one side of their mouth, but then they want to take away the resources to get there out of the other side of their mouth. And that's what we need to do a better job as Republicans putting a spotlight on. Look, the de if you talk to the police officers, they know what they need to do. They know the additional training that would help. They, they know how to go work communities. But if you keep taking away the resources, they can't get there. And as Republicans, we need to stand up for that and help make sure that we have the resources for them so they could do their job in those communities. Thank you. Mr. Hugo, going to you. You know, Sarah, you know, when I was a little kid, you know, my mom always told me the police officer is your friend. And I've taught my kids that, and I believe that today. If you're in a problem, you're in a jam, the police officer is, is your friend. And we, we understand that as Republicans, we know it. I don't believe our Democratic friends believe that. You know, a few years ago, I did a constitutional amendment that provided tax break for the uh, fallen officers. And, you know, one of, the, one of the Democrats said, well, what's different from them, any other government employee? And I said, you know what? God bless all the government employees, but not every government employee goes into a dark building at night with body armor on and side, sidearm strapped and their spouse wondering if they're coming home. What we have done in the last year, few years, is undermine the morale of the police officers. They are leaving. The new ones are not coming in like they should. You know, the police I've met with, they say usually in bad economic times, there's a lot of people trying to be police officers. Now, none. Guys, Democrats are taking our police and they're trying to take them to the woodshed for things that they didn't do. They are saying there may be one bad apple, but they're saying they're saying everyone there is bad. AOC and the squad today again called they didn't call it you know defund the police. Now they said abolish the police. What's the difference? That's the rhetoric that's coming out of Washington. That's the rhetoric that's coming out of Democrats. Look at Terry McAuliffe, the supposed Democratic front runner. He said he wants to eliminate qualified immunity. Well, I can tell you right now. I talked, and some of you were there Friday night. I talked to a police officer at an event. We were all there Friday night. He said, if qualified immunity is eliminated, police will leave in droves. Ladies and gentlemen, whether it's the Commonwealth attorneys who aren't prosecuting, whether it's the police having to be in their, their morale undermined, whatever this happens, we have got to stop it. We have got to get behind our police because those are the men and women that are behind us. And as my mom told me when I was a little kid, the police officer is your friend. If you don't know that, we will tell you. Democrats don't know it. Republicans and conservatives do. We will take that message out there. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Regular, uh, close us out. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, we need to fund strongly the police. Um, there are economic consequences if we don't. And there are also obviously personal consequences if we don't. Look, businesses rely on a strong police force. That's who they call when they have a problem. You know, suburbanites rely on a strong police force to keep them safe. Cities rely, listen, 
I used to live in liberal Alexandria. And the last thing the liberals wanted in Alexandria was to defriend the police, even though they would, you know, they they go along with the mantra. OK, so the, the point is, we as Republicans have to fight against the progressive socialist mantra that the police are bad and that the criminals are good. OK, that's first and foremost. Also, my uncle was a police guy. He uh, was a policeman up in New York City and he loved his position. He loved his job. And the one thing he would say to me is that, you know what, I don't care how much money they pay me as long as the little guy on the street respects me. And what they did in New York is they required certain officers, certain ones, rookies, to live among the people, to live in the boroughs, to live in the Bronx, to live in Brooklyn, to live down the city, to live up in the city. So, so people see them and feel them and touch them and, and realize that they're really nice people. They're here to protect me. And you know what? The, the worst victims of, poli, poli, of brutality are the poor. You know, they're, the, they're the, the ones that really need the police the most in the toughest areas of our counties and our cities. So I'm very strong, I'm a strong proponent of funding the police. Thank you, Ms. Riegler. Uh, we are now entering the lightning round. Uh, question one is on party solidarity. Uh, you will each have 30 seconds to answer the question. Uh, the candidate order will be Aluwalia, Allen, Davis, Hugo, Riggler, and Sears. Uh, so we'll start with you, Mr. Aluwalia. What's the question, please? I'm sorry. Mark? That would be helpful, wouldn't it? Sorry about that. Uh, the question is, if you are not elected to be the Republican nominee for lieutenant governor, do you pledge to throw your support behind the candidate who does win the Republican nomination? I apologize, you may go, Mr. Otherwise. Mark, I've been a loyal soldier of the Republican Party for the last 20 years. My intention was never to run for office, but as President Trump said, if somebody's not gonna do the job, if they did the job, then I wouldn't be here running for office. That's how I felt, and that's how I feel. But most importantly, this is a fight which we cannot let, let go. We have to win this, and I believe for the last 20 years, I was the only Indian American who was there. And guess what? Now we have got Vincent, who I brought into the party, and Suleika, who was also in there. I'm glad my goal is to expand the party and win. And yes, I'll support. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Allen? Right. Uh, absolutely, I would. Um, I would not go on a riding campaign against our Republican nominee. I believe our party <laughs> and our principles are way above that. And I also believe that on day two, if I'm not your first phone call, I certainly want to be your second. Where do you want me door knocking and what do you want me doing? Because that's how important this race is. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, I, look, I agree with Flames 100%. Look, all of us are better than anyone the Democrats could put up. I'd love to be the party's nominee and fight alongside everyone as the Lieutenant Governor nominee. But if I happen not to be that person, I will be right behind any one of us who happens to be that nominee. There is way too much to stake this year. We don't need someone uh, on the Democratic side continuing their agenda. We need to stop it now. And all of us would be the perfect person to go up there and be able to get that done and not be uh, honored to be behind any of them. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hugo. Uh, Mark, I've always supported the Republican nominee. Every race, I've always gone out there afterwards, even if my candidate didn't win, and tried to raise the money, gone door to door for them, uh, did whatever it takes. Whoever wins this nomination, I will wholeheartedly support, as I always have. All right, thank you. And Ms. Riggler? Yes, of course, I would be honored to support the nominee for Lieutenant Governor. But you know what, we have to win Northern Virginia. And I'm born and raised here in Northern Virginia. I know how Northern Virginians think, and I know what kind of candidate they'll vote for. And I am that candidate. But if I am not that candidate, I will certainly help any one of my wonderful opponents get that vote here in Northern Virginia. Thank you. And Ms. Sears. Yes, I would support. Uh either one of my opponents here, I do believe we must win. I expect that with all of the work that we're going to be doing, 
that we will win. And it's only, we've just got to get through November because November is D-Day. November is the day that we will win. So I expect that if I am not the nominee, I will be out full force because we have to win. Otherwise, we are looking at either the constitution or communism. I believe that's where we're headed. One of those will prevail. And Thank so we've got to win. Very good, thank you. And then the final question of the lightning round, uh, each of you again, will have 30 seconds each to respond. Uh, and the candidate order for this one uh, will be uh, Delegate Davis, Delegate Hugo, Ms. Rigler, uh, Ms. Sears, Mr. Alawalia, and Mr. Allen. Uh, the question is this, uh, we understand that each of you are Republicans and conservatives and have been around the movement for a long time, love you all. Um, but what would you say uh, separates you from from your uh, your opponents in this race. What is the, the one thing that you would say separates you, distinguishes you uh, from from your fellow candidates? It, it's simple. I win. I mean, I'm the only one here that has ever run for office that has never lost to a Democrat. Uh, even when I had to face 1.1 million dollars against me at 250 thousand that we had I in a district that Tim Kaine won by 10 points. We still won by sticking to our Republican principles and values and taking the fight to the Democrats. And I think that's what the difference is. We all as Republican believe in the same things, our same morals or values, but this year is about someone that can win and I've never lost. Delegate Hugo? You know, I, I'm gonna say this. Look, there's a reason that Ken Cuccinelli, Corey Stewart, the Oven Chains, Morton Blackwell, Dick Black, you know, many other conservatives across the state are supporting me. And it's because for almost two decades, I've demonstrated that I can win in a conservative area, a liberal area with a conservative message. I have delivered time after time after time on life, on fighting taxes, on protecting life, and on the Second Amendment. That's the reason why I'm a conservative that can win and deliver Northern Virginia. Ms. Rigler. Yes, hello. I am the only candidate in this race that is standing up against voter fraud and screaming from the rooftops, fight for voter integrity. Look, this race is not about endorsements or who you know, how, how long you've been in office. This race is about beating the Democrats in November and we must beat them. I'm Ms. Sears. Yes, I am the only Lieutenant Governor in this race who has had three gubernatorial candidates endorse me saying that they want me to be the lieutenant governor candidate for the Republican Party. Furthermore, I am the only Republican in this race who has endured death threats because I am a Republican, where the state police had to protect my family by wiring my house and wiring my phones, and I had to have a protective order taken out against the people who were threatening my life and I remained a Republican. Thank you, Winston. So, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Allen. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I apologize. Mr. Alawalia. I, I got oh, that wrong, yeah, I apologize. Yeah. Pretty, go sorry. ahead, buddy, sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, go for the heat. I can't no read it, I apologize. Mr. Alawalia. Mike, uh, Mr. Ginsburg. I'm the American dream, folks, which is in peril, which is now almost turning into a socialist experiment which the democrats are doing right across from washington dc i'm the only one who's laid out a concrete plan senator vogel lost by 143,000 votes i have showed that how we get 275,000 votes to win in november <clears throat> i am the only person jesus and now mr allen i apologize mr allen yeah, no, thank you. Um, my integrity. My answers are honest and authentic. I don't lean on endorsements. Um, I don't claim to be pro-family and vote against school choice. I don't claim to be pro-Second Amendment and then introduce red flag laws. You may not agree with me on every issue, but I'm always been honest and authentic about where I stand. And I think that's what differentiates me from the rest of the candidates in the field. Thank you.
Excellent. Thank you. And that that uh, turns us over to, to our, uh, I guess, the, the closing statement. So, Mark, I think uh, I think you're up. Yes. Uh, closing statements. Uh, you will each have two minutes for your closing statements. Um, and now I got to figure out the order. <laughs> Who started the last time? <laughs> okay. So the order would be Hugo, Riggler, Sears, Aluwalia, Allen, and Davis. Uh, closing statements, two minutes each. Uh, so, Mr. Hugo. Mark, thank you and thank you to everybody for having us out here. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Look, I'm Tim Hugo. I'm running for lieutenant governor. Yeah, I've got conservatives who are endorsing me from across the state because they know you need some conservative from Northern Virginia can win. But I'm running not because of endorsements. I'm running because I'm worried about the future of Virginia and the future of America. You've heard all of us talk tonight, but I'd ask you, listen to the Democrats. Listen to what they say what they want to do and where they want to go. They will tell you straight up where they're going. Some people thought that, oh my goodness, it'll lighten up. They just didn't like Donald Trump. Understand my friends, they don't like any one of us. They don't like the way we preach. They don't like the way we marry. They don't like the way we run our businesses because half of them, a lot of them are socialists and they are coming after us. They are coming after our second amendment. They're coming after due process. And ladies and gentlemen, they're coming after your first amendment rights. You used to just think they were trying to indoctrinate the kids in the college campuses. Now they're trying to indoctrinate the kids in K through 12. And in the end, they're coming after your voice. They wanna make sure that you don't have the opportunity to speak on taxes, on life, on the second amendment. This is a dear, different day. Did you ever think that you would have a democratic governor talking casually about infanticide? Or that Beto O'Rourke would be going door to door against people like me talking about guns, taking our guns? Did you ever think we'd have governors they would be saying casually, we're just gonna raise taxes or that we're gonna eliminate qualified immunity for our police and protect the ones who protect us. I just ask you, let us step up and fight. Edmund Burke said the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is good men to do nothing. This is the year for good men and good women to step up and fight. Because if we don't step up and fight the Democrats and their leftist agenda, we will leave our children a battlefield they may not be able to win. I ask you for three things. I ask you to call me, give me your ideas. I'll ask you for your support. But in the end, I'll ask you for your prayers for me, my family, but for all these candidates and for our Virginia, pray for Virginia and pray for the United States because it is under attack by a leftist agenda. Thank you and God bless you. Thanks for having me here tonight. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Regler? Yes, thank you. I've always been an outsider. I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth, far from it. I watched my father beat my mother almost every night when I was growing up. So while most 16 year olds are learning how to drive, I was teaching myself how to read and write. I know the value of hard work. After learning the basics, I went on to community college. I went to a four year school, then law school. Then I opened up my own business. I work, my business is a very successful business providing high-tech laboratories all over the country with supercomputers. We even helped, I'm very proud to say this, with developing, or the scientists did, developing the COVID-19 vaccines. When I look at the hardworking men and women here in Fairfax County and all over Virginia, I'm reminded how blessed I am to be living the American dream. And isn't that what the Republican Party is all about? Look, to win in November, we need an outsider like me. We need a fighter for voter integrity. We need someone who has defended voter integrity. And we need someone who's not afraid to stand up against the Democrats. We need someone from Northern Virginia who understands the voters here and who know, I know, how to win. The Democrats, they want socialism. I want capitalism. The Democrats want to take away voter integrity and I will defend voter integrity. The Democrats want our guns, I will defend the second amendment. I will fight for conservatives here in Virginia. I will fight for you. I will fight for all of all of us. I am so proud to be running for Lieutenant Governor 
from this beautiful Commonwealth of Virginia. My name is Maeve Riegler. Please vote for me on May 8th. And if you're already committed, please, I'd love to be your second choice. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Riegler. Ms. Sears. I want to say this because we have to win in November. Yes, there is May, May 8th, but we have to win in November. And so we have to ask ourselves, having heard all of this, we're really not all straying from the Republican Party principles. We all want for freedom. We all want openness. We all want 2A, pro-life, all of that good stuff. But folks, if we don't win, none of it matters. It's all fairy dust. Somewhat, somebody has to win. We have to win in order to change all of the wonderful things that you hear we want to change, repeal, etc. That would be me. I can win. I can take us across the finish line because I did that. I ran against an incumbent, had the office for 11 years in a 62% Democrat district. His father had the seat for 20 years, so I ran against a family dynasty. Furthermore, I had this pact that we went and got new voters for President Trump. We're going to lose those new voters. The president in Virginia got 44.9% of the vote to the Democrats 50 something. Uh, Sen uh, Gade, who should have been our Senator, got 43.6% to the Democrats 50 something. Folks, Gillespie and Cuccinelli got 45, 45%. We need new voters. They are in the Democrat party. We can go get them. We just have to make those relationships, make the case, I can do that. I have a strategy to win them. I have won with that strategy. I look like that strategy. No more fairy dust. We must win. That would be me. The Democrats are hoping you don't send me because they don't want to see me at the end of a debate stage because they don't know how to handle me. We've got to win. And that person is me. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Ms. Sears. Um, Mr. Alawalia. First thing is I apologize to Mike Ginsburg. I couldn't finish the question uh, response earlier because I had a call and I lost the, the site. But most importantly, folks, we have to win because every Virginia is counting on our unity. We cannot, you're not my opponents, you're my friends, you were teammates, we are one team. And what is important is that we are fighting socialism. And the reason why I'm fighting is because the American dream is in peril. And I am the embodiment of the American dream. And most importantly, I have laid out the plan of not only getting the 50,000 South Asian Americans, 125,000 of other Asian, Hispanic, African Americans, and Black Americans, and most importantly, the 100,000 suburban moms, single mom, and the Y generation and the Z generation. Folks, this is an important race. If I did not feel it was so important, I would not have jumped into it because I feel the frog theory is in full motion. The conditioning is going on and we need to do something about this. A lot of people talk the pendulum is gonna swing. I will ensure it swings 100% because I'm gonna work hard and already talking to those communities to win there. Folks, I'm the margin of victory, but it's your choice because I'm not gonna ask for great endorsements. What I need is endorsement from every person who's going out to vote. Check the records of all candidates who are running. Look at the hard work, the, the min, the, the business acumen, the business experience, and the other experiences they have. We are all good people, but then it's important is who can deliver that victory? You have to think about that. I, I would be honored and proud to be your next Lieutenant Governor. And guess what? I'm gonna work very hard to expand my party and make sure that we promote our common sense conservative values. Thank you and appreciate the opportunity. Please check out puneetforlg.com. Thank you, Mr. Alawali. Uh, Mr. Allen. There's a story that my grandfather used to tell, and some of my opponents have heard this, so they won't laugh too much. But uh, there's a story that my grandfather used to tell about a man who died at, at, in a field, by the way. Um, he got to heaven and, and met St. Peter, and Peter said, you know, uh, show me your scars and I'll let you in. And the man, I don't have any scars. And he said, what a shame. Was there nothing in your life worth fighting for? The reason I'm telling you that story is I believe for far too long, 
Republicans and Democrats, politicians have negotiated our rights. They don't believe that they're absolute. You, you can't afford to feed your family because your taxes are too high. All of our taxes are too high. You can't afford to keep your business open because of regulation, because of ridiculous mandates. You can't afford to give your children a good education. There are a lot of problems in Virginia, and they didn't just start last year. They didn't just start under one Democratic administration. We have a chance for real change in Virginia, and now is the time to do that. Now is the time to give the people of Virginia their voices back. They haven't been heard. They've been ignored. They've been trampled on. And right now, I would argue, is your chance to send someone up who represents that voice. I wanna be that person. I hope you'll vote for me on May the 8th and I hope that whoever the nominee is, that you'll vote for true conservatives in November because I believe we can fix this state. I believe we can give you a voice back, a government of the people, by the people and for the people. I believe we can make this a great place for jobs, a great place for businesses and a wonderful place for families again. And I would be so honored to be a part of that. Thank you so much for everything tonight. Thank you to our grateful host for putting this together. And thank you to all of my other statewide candidates. I really always enjoy our time together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, Mr. Davis. Well, thank you for having this. I really appreciate the opportunity. I think one thing we all agree on is we're all conservatives. We're all gonna support the nominee. And the most important thing is who can actually win. You know, when you look at it, I've been involved in Republican politics going back to 1991 on Frank Ragnar's race and Bob McDonald, and I helped Ken Cuccinelli when he got the nomination and so on and so forth. I remember so far back, when some I remember your, your election in 01. I mean, I know the dynasty. Billy Robert, uh, uh, Robinson was uh, the, uh, the, the seatmate to Bob McDonald. I remember the ethics violations he had, and, you know, the, the dynasty kind of crumbled over the ethics violation, and going to jail doesn't hurt either when you try to, to beat someone. I you know, when we talk about who can win, I think it's fair to say that I've probably gotten more votes than anyone here running for office. When I ran for city council in 2008, I had 79,000 votes I had to get to win that election against a 28-year incumbent. That's more than even the congressional race you had against Bobby Scott, Winsome. I mean, if you need someone, if you want someone that can win, look at someone who's run and had to get almost 100,000 votes to win against a Democratic family. Look at someone that's actually run in a blue district and ran against $1.1 million when they put 250000 up and stick it to our Republican principles and, and values, went to the Democratic area and said, look, this is why you actually benefit. It's, we believe we're the party of equality. We're the party of level playing fields. We're the party that believes that every child deserves a chance at a first-class education and it comes from school choice. And it's the Democrats is why you don't have it today. We have to have Republicans that will take the fight to the Democrats and go get the areas that we need back. We have to go have Republicans that will go into the minority areas and show that we will stand up against critical race theory when they're being discriminated against. That's what I've been doing. If there's one theme that we've had today is I haven't been telling you this whole night what it is I'm going to do. I've been telling you what it is I have been doing and what I then will continue to do as your next lieutenant governor. Thank you. Well, I want to uh, thank everyone for coming out tonight, the candidates for joining us tonight. What a great group of candidates we have running in Virginia this year for Lieutenant Governor. I'm very excited about them and uh, all of you did a fine job this evening. I also want to thank our moderators, rule keepers, timekeepers, and uh, everyone that was involved in organizing and putting this together. And certainly, not last but not least, I want to remind everybody that one week from tonight at 7 o'clock, we will have the uh, Governor's Forum, and we look forward to that and look forward to seeing you then as well. Uh, with that, it brings us to the end of our forum tonight. Again, thank everybody for participating, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the campaign trail. Thank you. Thanks, Gary.